Welcome everybody to this course which is given online by Lightboard. So <clears throat> some of you are already familiar with this format, most of you are new. So technically it's sometimes a little bit complicated. So whenever you don't hear me or you don't see me or if something else is happening, then just give sign. The best thing is just you speak out loud uh, because I cannot read the chat while giving the course. So I'm Herwig Hauser from the University of Vienna. I am actually working in algebraic geometry, but a couple of years ago I got more and more interested in differential equations, especially Fuchsian differential equations, and uh, I started to work on it, and my plan is also to write a lecture notes. And uh, I want to share with you my fascination for this subject, mostly because it involves so many different techniques. Yeah? As the title of this course mentions, it is algebra, it is analysis, it is combinatorics, it's number theory. So <clears throat> different methods merge to, to find out what's going on. And moreover, the theory is highly non-trivial and still has a lot of open questions and very famous conjectures. So we will do it weekly. We will keep the website alive in the sense there will be announcement, but I will also occasionally send you an email if special information uh, is given to you. So I ask everybody to register, those who have not done yet, to register on the website. So this has no other implication that just you are in the box and I can send you occasionally and if necessary an email. I will not give your email address to anybody else and don't worry, no compromise. It's just <clears throat> organizationally easier. Another thing is, uh, I see that there are some experts attending also today. So for these experts, at least at the beginning, it is uh, rather boring because I have to do the, the basics. So <clears throat> you don't lose anything if you skip these introductory lectures as today. In any case, all classes will be recorded and put on YouTube, so you can watch them afterwards, and you can also watch them at higher speed, which is sometimes quite convenient if you don't have so much time, and in any case, if you don't take notes or so. Okay? What else? So, the plan is to do it until end of January, every Tuesday. Uh, for the Japanese people, there are a few, of course, the time delay makes it difficult to attend, but they can watch afterwards. I think I will also give you each week kind of problems you can think about it, because already an online format is difficult to follow, because sometimes you are busy, sometimes you lose a class, and then it's difficult to, to catch up. So I will give you easy exercises, and if you want, you can think about them, you can solve them, we can even have a kind of discussion session. And like this, you have more ease to follow the class and to keep alive, okay, with the class. As for exams, in principle, everybody can do an exam, and I can also write a certificate about this. If you want to do so, then you should contact your own university, your department of mathematics, and ask whether they accept this type of certificate for your own curriculum. You know? Because <clears throat> usually outside exams are kind of delicate, but if you have an agreement with your responsible person, then it might be very valuable to make an exam for this class at the end of the course, and then you can hand it in and use it for your own studies. Okay. So whenever you have a, a question during the class, or if you want to make a comment, just put on your microphone and tell it to me. That's the easiest thing. So I have the microphone down here. I hope that this works. If the noise or the sound is not good, please let me know, and I put it here. But I cannot really move. Um, <clears throat> or maybe I can even put it without cable. 
Let me try it like this, if this is better. This should also work. So <clears throat> I should also mention that this, this light board, which is uh, just a crystal board, transparent board, was constructed and designed by my colleague Michael Eichmeier, and they use it uh, for classes to secondary class school and high school students. And he is so gentle to let me use it. it. In general, it works well. It has, of course, some inconveniences. The first one is that the board is not too big. So I have to write rather small. You will be able to read it. But I have to erase quite often. So this takes a little bit of time, but I cannot avoid it. And uh, it gives you time to think about what we were talking about. Okay. So another thing is, which I would like to share with you, in front of me, I have a monitor with your names. And I also have the camera, which is above. And I have to speak to the camera so that you see me in front. No? But that's not so easy because the camera is not alive as a human face. So sometimes I look somewhere else because I have to think about something. But now, <laughs> since I do this type of classes, I did one uh, last year, I observe very much television moderators, speakers at the television. They always look at you. They look at you as you were a person there, and they fix your eyes on you. That's not. Uh, so obvious to do, but they do it very well. And I will also try to do it, but sometimes it's just not possible. Okay, It's a little bit more exigent to do such a kind of class than in, in the usual classroom where you're at the blackboard. But of course, the advantage is that you, you see my gestures, you see my face while I'm writing on the blackboard. OK? So. <clears throat> I think we can start if you don't have any questions. In any case, feel free to write me an email if you want to either criticize something or tell me that you like it, or if you want to propose a topic, if you have questions, and so on. So I think we can start. And I hope that the recording works. So let me write again the title. And I will call it Fuchsian. Differential equations. This already appeared in the trailer, which most of you have seen. So that's now a standard term in the field. Everybody knows what is meant by Fuchsian. And uh, so the subtitle would be Algebra Analysis. And number theory, and also combinatorics, and so on, but that's OK. So today we will just introduce the main players of this game. What is a differential equation? We are not yet defining what it means to be Fuchsian, uh, but I will give some hints. So in the first half, we will just define whatever we need. And in the second half, I want to give you a whole bunch of different differential equations and their solutions to show you how small changes in the differential equation can have a huge effect on the type of solutions. Our goal will be to understand not just by computing how the solutions look like, but to recognize from the equation why this and this type of solution occurs. OK? So <clears throat> a main concept is the concept of singularity. So this means that our differential equations will depend on a variable. We are doing just a one variable case. And if we want to solve a differential equation, in contrast to the case of constant coefficients, the solutions will go to infinity. Yeah? But they can go to infinity at a different speed. Yeah, they can explode 
and have essential singularities, or they can have kind of moderate singularities, a, a, a moderate growth to infinity, sorry. So according to this, we get a classification of our differential equations. But before starting with the basics, let me just mention the name of Lazarus Fuchs. So he asked himself, can you characterize those ordinary linear differential equations which have nice solutions? He had to make precise what he means by, by nice solution or moderate solution, which we will do also here. And then he was able to characterize these. And this opened up, as I already told in the Taylor, this opened up a huge area of research. So this was a paper in 1866 in the Journal of Pure and Applied Algebra, which is also called Krelle. Krelle's Journal. And in a certain way, this journal between 1866 and 1886 collected most of the important works on this topic. So Fuchs had several papers in Krelle's journal. Frobenius, who came shortly afterwards, had several ones. Tome, so maybe I should also write uh, here Frobenius. And somebody who is, is less known, Tome, he has, I think, five papers. <clears throat> These papers are not easy to read. First, they are in an old language, but also the objects are often not well defined, or they are defined in a way which you have to guess because there was a kind of custom to treat objects at that time. For instance, how you do asymptotics. And after a while, you get used to what is meant. So <clears throat> at the beginning, my, the course will be based on the paper of Fuchs. He has a second one in 1868, which complements his first uh, article. And then Fobenius in 1873, and Tomei also in 1870. Okay. So of course, both Fuchs and Frobenius are very well known for many other uh, research they have done. Yeah, there are the Fuchsian groups, and Fuchs was a very versatile and uh, uh, multifaceted researcher, and Frobenius even more. You know? Especially Frobenius is well known in number theory, differential geometry, and many other things. So let me start with the outset. By the way, we also have a, there's another technical problem. These, these pens, they last not very long, and I only have four here. So I hope that I can, I can finish today without any problems. So let me first fix the outset. You see, the, it is already fading out a little bit, but you should be able to read. So our object will be linear ordinary, homogeneous, differential equations. And of course, all their solutions. So let me specify what do we have. Let me write it like this. So L will always stand for the differential operators, which is behind. I will define differential operators later. So let me write L of y. y stands for a variable, but we want to find a function in x. So the solution will be uh, y equals y of x. So we treat both y as a variable as an unknown function. And we will have, let me write it like this, a n x y n derivative plus a n minus 1 of x y n minus 1 plus 
a1 x y prime plus a0 of x times y, zero is derivative of y equals zero. Okay. So it is linear in y as derivation is linear. Okay, that refers to the linearity. It is ordinary in the sense that y will only depend on one variable. y of x depends on one variable. So that's, of course, the easiest case, one variable x. And this variable can be looked at either locally or globally. So this is usually complex. We work over C, and we allow our variable to vary either in C, varying in C or in P1C. So we also allow infinity, which is a classical situation. So we write P1C, the projective line over C, just adding one point at infinity. I will explain, not today, but further on, when we do more computations, how you study the equation at infinity. Okay. So there are two types of, of questions. We can look at local solution, local solutions versus global solutions. We have to define what we mean by solution. And the quality of the solutions will depend on the quality of the coefficients. So the coefficients ai of x are functions of x. Obviously. And for instance, already a very important case is polynomials. Polynomials or holomorphic functions. And when I say holomorphic functions, they could be defined uh, on arbitrary open subsets defined on u in p1c, open. Often we just take a neighborhood of 0 because we are interested uh, in the quality of the solutions at 0. Okay? And again, of course, ai of x depend on just one variable. Now, homogeneous refers that we have here no term uh, b of x alone without y. Yeah. We have a 0 here. Of course, one could also consider having here equal to b of x, uh, but the theory is kind of smoother to, to be done without this term. And whenever this b of x is a polynomial, you can eliminate it by deriving further on. Okay? So the homogeneous case already represents the main phenomena. Okay? Very good. So the, as you might know, the, the critical information here is this coefficient. The first coefficient plays a crucial role. And this is due to the fact that <clears throat> if you would have here a constant and all the other i holomorphic, then you can apply the theorem of Kozhikovalevskaya, okay? which again will appear later on in more detail, but I just drop the name here. If, let's say, let us look at 0 
So if a n zero is non-zero, then assume that you have holomorphic coefficients. Then you can divide everything in a neighborhood of zero by a n of x, and you get a monic differential equation. Then locally at zero, You can control the solutions by the theorem of Cauchy, the classical theorem of Cauchy and Kovalevskaya. Apply Cauchy, Kovalevskaya. Today I am not citing, not giving the details. I just want to give you an overview. And <clears throat> this is a case where. You still have conjectures, but which is in some sense the easy one. Okay. But if we are again at zero and the leading coefficient vanishes, then all kind of phenomena may appear. So now I have to erase already. I hope it works. So now let us talk a little bit about the solutions of Ly equals 0. L stands for a differential operator. So this depends very much where we search for our solutions. Yeah. One has to specify a space F where the solutions live. Which is not completely obvious. You could take holomorphic functions. You could take meromorphic functions. You could take formal power series. You could take, I mean, hyperfunctions or something else. So part of the story will be to make a suitable space, very precise and concrete, and then to look for solutions, and not just for one solution, but we want a basis of solutions. Now, as everything is linear, the space of solutions will be a vector space over C. Let us stick for the moment to the complex numbers. And the general theory tells you that such a basis will have precisely n elements, having n equals the order of the differential equation. I just write order of L, many elements. So of course, we can be happy to find just one solution. But in general, we are only satisfied if we have n linearly independent solutions. Now, why do we consider this over C? So if you derive constants, then you get 0, of course. So let me write here already, C is the field of constants. Of, I write my differentiation as del, and this will be just d with respect to dx. Okay. We could also consider different fields, base fields. We could take even fields of characteristic p and different derivations, but for the beginning, we just take this, <coughs> this situation. Now, <clears throat> solutions may be so to have polynomial solution is very rare but maybe polynomial holomorphic they could be Puiseux series I will define them also Puiseux series Formal power series. Then 
as you have already seen in the trailer, one has to allow logarithms, powers of logarithms, and we will even have, in certain situations, worse solutions, something like, I let me just write as an example, you may have x of 1 over x. So this now at 0 has an essential singularity. Singularity at 0. But the situation is quite well understood, and one knows perfectly well what happens. But there is one type of questions which is uh, still very mysterious and uh, actually a topic of recent research. Uh, uh, a main interest is the following. Assume that your differential equation has polynomial coefficients, a, i, x, and let them take even polynomials with integer coefficients. Okay. So you are in a finite situation. You just have finitely many polynomials as a coefficient. And <clears throat> ask for criterion to get algebraic functions as solutions. So algebraic functions means these are, let's say, holomorphic functions defined in a neighborhood of 0. And they satisfy a polynomial equation. Okay. I will give you an example instead of defining them properly. We will do this later on. We could take y of x, for instance, the case root of 1 plus x. Okay. <clears throat> this is, of course, a very simple algebraic function, and it satisfies the differential equation, as you can check easily. But to see from the differential equation whether you have an algebraic solution, that's extremely difficult and very interesting because it involves all types of arguments. And another thing which is also interesting to get algebraic functions, also the integrality of the coefficients of y of x. So you assume you have a power series solution, holomorphic or formal, doesn't matter. You expand it in a series, and you observe that all the coefficients are integers. So this happens from time to time. And you have sometimes you have criteria to know why it happens, but there are many examples where it just happens and you don't know why. So the integrality of the coefficients of y, x, as a series. OK. So let me let me give uh, a few more definitions. What is a singularity of L y equals zero? So a singularity is a point a in P1C, where the leading coefficient a n of x vanishes. So that's not completely precise, because it could be that you multiplied, for instance, your differential equation, all coefficients by x. Yeah? You start with a 
upon this constant coefficients. You multiply everything by x, and then x equals 0 would be a singularity, but it is just an artificial singularity. No? So more precisely, where sum ai of x, an of x, has a pole. This is the precise definition. If you divide by a n of x, so you make your differential equation monic, and then you look at the new coefficients, which are these here. If you have a pole at a, then you say your differential equation has a singularity. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there are three types. which can occur. I just dropped the names. So the first one is a pure parent singularity. So a parent singularity means that even that you have a pole of the coefficients, nothing strange happens. So here you have holomorphic solutions. This is, of course, as we now look at points, everything is local at the moment. Then we have regular singularities. Now here the terminology is really bad because this looks like a contradiction, regular singularity, but it is standard. The regular singularity means that the solutions are kind of moderate solutions nearby A of singularities A. Moderate means that as you, in the, in the singularity, the solution is not defined or infinity. But as you go there, the growth is not too bad. It is at most polynomial. Okay? So this means no essential singularity of the solutions. And then we have the irregular case. This would correspond to a solution, as I indicated before, the exponential of 1 over x. And here you have uh, essential singularity, or even worse. Uh, I don't want to write bad solutions, but let us say pathologic. Solutions. Okay. Of course, we will define all this uh, in the in the classes. And Fuchs said to himself, "If I precisely define what I mean by moderate solutions, can I detect from my differential equations a, equation L whether the solutions are moderate or not?" And this he was able to 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 solve. And he gave a criterion nowadays known as the criterion of Fuchs, describing precisely those differential equations which have a regular singularity okay, at a given point. So <clears throat> if you look at this equation, it is a scalar equation. You just have one equation. Now, one could also look at systems of equations, may pass from scalar equation to systems. This will also take a little bit of time in our class. So now I write capital Y for a vector, capital Y1, Yn, but I take it as a column vector. Okay, And we take a matrix A which is a matrix of functions in Mn. And now we take here some ring. Let me write here O. Or maybe O is, o is not good. <laughs> maybe you take meromorphic functions here. Uh, 
Let me take for the moment just meromorphic. Okay. So you may have poles here. And then you get a system. You take y prime, which is now y1 prime up to yn prime. And you require that this is equal to ax times y1 yn. Okay. Now you have already seen in your classes on ordinary differential equations that you can always transform a scalar equation to a system. Yeah, you just introduce these variables as the derivatives of your variable y. Okay. <clears throat> so you can, in parallel, you could study systems where you just have now this is first order system because we just have <clears throat> the derivatives of y prime of y1 up to yn. Okay? Now, it's not completely obvious that you also can go back. So if you have given such a system, you can find a scalar equation, which is precisely the one where the system comes from. So <clears throat> conversely, one can go from systems to scalar equation, scalar nth order equations. And this is often quoted as the cyclic vector lemma. So what I want to say is that you have two frameworks where you can operate. Either you take scalar equations and of order n in one variable, or you take systems of n equations, which are just first order. It's equivalent, even though the dictionary between the two is not completely obvious. Okay. <clears throat> so if you start, maybe I should specify this. But first, I have to erase. It's not difficult to compute this matrix here when you start from a scalar equation. So if you have, if you have Ly equal 0 scalar equation of order n as before, get y prime equals ax times y. And now I write al in, in, in order to indicate that this comes from L. So al will be called the companion matrix. of Ly equals 0. And uh, I am always mistaking how to write it. It has zeros on the diagonals. And here you have it, the n by n matrix. Then on the, on the second, on the upper diagonal, you have ones. And in the last row, here you have all the zeros. And then you have minus, I don't have space to write it, A0 divided by An up to minus A1. No, sorry, An minus 1 An. So it's an n by n matrix. Okay. And going back is much harder, yeah? And actually not really explicit. That will be an exercise. Maybe we can find a better way to go back. Now, there's a third interpretation, another viewpoint, which goes into cor in combinatorics. If y of x equals ck x to the k, k equals 0 to infinity, 
is a power series solution of Ly equals zero, then you just plug it in and you compare coefficients, then comparison of coefficients gives you a linear recursion for the CK. Let me write it like this. CK equals P1 K CK minus 1 plus <coughs> P D of K CK minus D. So this will be a recursion now of order D. D is not the order of the differential equation L. D can be computed directly. Now, assume that you have that your coefficients of Ly are itself power series, formal or convergent, then the P, no, sorry, let me, let me assume that, assume that the Ai of x are polynomials, which is by far the most important case, then the p j of k are also polynomials, but now in k, in the index, in k. So that's this type of recurrences is also called polynomially rec recursive. Polynomially recursive sequence CK K in N. It's a matter of taste. Sometimes it is quite convenient to look at the linear recursion and try to solve this iteratively, but also very strange phenomena occur. And uh, yeah, I think that's from the theoretical part of view, just to give you uh, the basic uh, ingredients, everything. I will make now a five minutes break and we'll be back in a moment so I can, I can erase the blackboard, take a little bit of water, and then we will start and continue with a bunch of examples. Okay. I am back again. I hope you are also still here. And we go over two examples. Maybe we switch the color because the red one was already fading out. So examples. Sorry, before we continue, I just noticed that there were two questions in the chat. OK, um, thank you. Let me. Let me see. Yes, uh, but thank you for your comments and questions. I will, I will specify this when we come to linear recursions. Uh, it depends how you interpret your PIs, yes. Yeah? There could be a coefficient in front of CK, but you could also allow the PIs to be rational functions instead of polynomials. That's correct. So maybe you add this, the PI of K are rational functions, so quotients of polynomial rational functions in K. I said polynomials, but that's too restrictive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chiara. So we start uh, with more or less trivial examples, but we will see. The first one will be, of course, the exponential function. Uh, 
And you observe here, so even though this looks, uh, is of course well known, you observe that in the series expansion of the exponential function, you have infinitely many primes appear in the denominator. Yeah? So to write the exponential functions, you need all primes in the denominators. This will be crucial later on. Now, if you modify here a little bit, if you take <coughs> 2xy, then we get y of x equals e to the x square. If we take y prime equals xy, we get y of x equals e x square half. <coughs> so that's uh, not so interesting, but to warm up. Now we move the x to the other side xy prime equals y. So, of course, this is now a little bit just playing around, but it should motivate the theory we are giving later on. And the theory will be partly algebraic and partly analytic. Okay. So here we get y of x equals x. If we take xy prime equals 2y, we get y of x, x square, and of course, xy prime equals ky. The solution will be y of x, x to the k, the monomials. So you will see this is even simpler than the exponential function, the last three. We get monomial solutions. That's, of course, an exceptional case and will not interest us so much. Now. As I already told you in the trailer, let me repeat the equation. Now we take a second order equation, x square y double prime minus 2xy prime plus y equals 0, y1 equals x, y2 equals x square, as you immediately verify. I don't tell you yet how you find these, uh, but it's easy to check once you have them. So if you now take instead, sorry, here we have a 2, x square y double prime minus x y prime plus y equals 0. So you just modified a little bit the coefficients, and you would like to understand how this affects the solutions. So the first solution will be again x, but the second one will be more complicated, y2 is x times log of x. So you get a logarithm here. And uh, of course, you just plug it in, and you see these are two linearly independent solutions, so you have a basis. But what is interesting is not to guess this solution, but to deduce that it must be like this. So how do you, if you don't know anything about the logarithm, how would you see from the equation that the logarithm must appear? Okay, and that's actually what Frobenius did, and uh, we will do it also. Let me continue with my examples. Let us take now k one plus x. Now we again. First order. So here you will get y. I don't write y of x, or maybe y of x. We get the kth root of 1 plus x. So we get an algebraic function. And at 0, it is also a power series. Power series at 0 because it is holomorphic at 0. Yeah, because of the one here. So this is an algebraic function, and the minimal polynomial is, of course, y to the k minus 1 plus x equals 0. Minimal polynomial. You see, this is a, a zoo of different equations, and all have a different flavor. So more generally, you can produce k roots of rational functions by taking r of x 
any rational function, and then you take k times r of x y prime minus r prime of x y equals zero. So r, let's take, I denote like this, the field of rational functions, or you could also take here polynomials if you want, and this would give you y of x equals the kth root of r of x. Again, an algebraic function. Okay. So this is the case of first order equations. Sticking to algebraic functions, consider now 6 times 1 plus x y double prime plus 1 plus x y prime plus y equals 0. And now you will see that things are getting more complicated. y of x. I just write down one solution, will be 1 plus x, so the square root, plus the third root of 1 plus x. Okay. So that's almost impossible to guess from the equation. How did I find this equation? I started with this one and I asked myself, what is the differential equation satisfied by this function? And as you have two roots, you will get second order. Okay. And in fact, there is a differential equation with polynomial coefficients, which is satisfied by this y. Now, this is a little bit artificial, because you could alternatively try to solve this equation, again, locally at 0. And you would get, actually, one solution, the square root, and the second solution, the third root. And as the space of solutions is a vector space, you also have the sum of them inside. Okay. So <clears throat> here is already a very interesting question, question I want to mention. For y1 and y2, it's easy to find the minimal polynomial. But the minimal polynomial for y of x, which is here, is much more complicated. Okay. So if you take the minimal polynomial, you will have uh, to take different minimal polynomials according to the choice of your basis of solutions here. And as we will see, there's a way to find from the minimal polynomial a differential equation with polynomial coefficients satisfied by our algebraic functions. That's a theorem. Okay. So, the question is the following. Let's take the minimal polynomial of y of x, of this one here. It will be complicated. It will have order 2. Sorry, it will not have order 2. Yes, it will have order 2, sorry. And you will have another solution. So you have the minimal polynomial will have finitely many solutions, whereas the differential equation, which is linear, will have a whole vector space of solutions. And the two are kind of related, but nobody understands completely how this relation goes. This will be one of the main topics of our course. So this was number three, where examples where you have algebraic functions as solutions. Now we come to uh, divergent solutions. Let me take x cubed y double prime. I have to copy it. I can, I'm unable to memorize this. Plus x squared minus x y prime. Of course, the, situation, the equations themselves don't tell you anything. And it will be my, my duty to convince you that you can read information from these equations. So again, we have two solutions, order two. And they're kind of funny. This one is the first divergence series you would think of, x to the k. And I add a 1 to simplify, k from 0 to infinity. So this is divergent. 
at zero, or everywhere actually. And y2 is of a completely different flavor. It is the exponential of minus 1 over x. So this has an essential singularity at 0, as mentioned before. So who is responsible to have two so different solutions of a harmless-looking differential equation? The story continues. Now we come to hypergeometric functions. The equation is still more complicated. This is the com most complicated one. Let me just write it down to have it complete. 6, 12x minus 7, y prime plus 5y equals 0. This is also a striking example because we have one solution, which is a rational function, which is just x to the minus 1, 6. So it is 1 over the 6th root of x. This is, of course, not holomorphic at 0, but it is well behaved. And the second one is a hypergeometric series f2, 1, with parameters 1 over 6, 5 over 6, 7 over 6, and variable x. So this is a Gaussian hypergeometric function, hypergeometric series. And in general, if you have two, if you have three parameters, a, b, c, then f21, I only define the f21s, a, b, c, and x is defined as, of course, you could give a, a whole course on hypergeometric functions, k equals 0 to infinity, a, k overlined, b, k overlined, c, k overlined, k factorial x to the k, where a, k overlined, is a times a plus 1 up to a plus k minus 1. This is also called the rising factorial. Or Pochhammer symbol. Okay. So in this case here, this y1 is algebraic. It satisfies a polynomial equation, whereas y2 is transcendental. Transcendental means not algebraic. Okay. Now, this maybe I should write here Gauss hypergeometric functions. These are second order differential equations having precisely a certain shape which can be indicated and will be indicated later on. So how is my time? Yeah, we, we started at, at 5. Um, I think I will not use the whole 90 minutes, especially today, but I will continue for some 10, 15 minutes because it's <clears throat> also to listen, it's a little bit tiring. And uh, as it is the first class, we will be happy to have at least some, some ideas what is going on. So, <clears throat> you can also come from combinatorics and look at generating series of certain sequences of numbers and then try to find the differential equation for these generating series. So this is now number 6. I was in green. Let us consider, for instance, the Catalan number. CK equals 1 over 2, K, sorry, 2 over K plus 1, 2K over K. Catalan numbers. 
And you probably know that they have many different interpretations in combinatorics when you count uh, whatever you want. Almost, not almost, or always, but very often Catalan numbers appear. So they are starting at k equals 0, 1, 1, 2, 5, 14, 42, 132, and so on. They are integers. But that's not clear because you divide here always by k plus 1. Of course, you can show that in the fraction you get the k plus 1 will cancel, but it's not completely obvious. But if you, if you take the generating series, y of x equals some ck x to the k, then you will see that this is actually 1 over 2x, 1 minus 1 minus 4x. So this is algebraic. It is well defined because the 1 will cancel here, and then you can divide by 2x. This is an algebraic function. And from this function, it is easy to show that the ck, the ck are integers. So it's really uh, a very elegant proof to show that the Catalan numbers are integers. So the minimal polynomial, which I denote pxy, is xy squared minus y plus 1. And the differential equation ly will be 1 half x minus 2x squared y double prime plus 1 minus 5x y prime plus y equals 0. So this again, I mean, why does this pop up and how do you, how do you find it? <clears throat> you can also give the recursion c0 is 1, the initial condition and ck, that's easy, 2k minus 1, k plus 1, ck minus 1. So it is a first order linear recursion. So I don't want to write so much, but I cannot avoid it. I have to mention here Aperi. He proved that zeta of 3 is irrational and became famous for this. And I'm not going to write down the differential equation, but I will write down the recursion. He has a sequence a, k, k in n. And the recursion is really crazy. 1 over k cubed, 34 k 3 minus 51 k squared plus 27 k minus 5 a k minus 1 minus k minus 1 3 a k minus 2. OK. So <clears throat> this was used, this recursion was used by Aperi to prove that zeta of 3 is irrational. Nobody knows how he found it. There are some guesses, but it's mostly a mystery. It works. And there's one striking thing which I want to mention. Now you can take, as you have a second order differential, uh, second order linear recursion, you can choose two initial values. If you take a0 equals 1 and a1 equals 5, then the ai will be in z, will be integers. So if you can find a direct proof of this fact, I think people would be very interested. The problem is that whenever you do the, when you run the recursion, you, might, you divide by k cubed. So to show that this is integer, you have to prove something here. No? Not clear at all. And it depends very much on the initial condition. If you take, now I write b, b0 equals 0, so you, and b1 equals 6, but the same recursion, then the bi <coughs> will have denominators which involve infinitely, infinitely many prime numbers. 
So I don't want to write it down. <coughs> the key word is not globally bounded. which means that you get rational numbers and in the denominators new and new primes appear, okay? So <clears throat> it's just a change of initial condition and a completely different behavior. So being globally bounded is something as almost like being integers. Okay. So The last one will be name dropping and just a few indications. Then you have the classical, the classical differential equations. Let's say from physics, but also from other fields, and they have all have uh, certain names. We have the Chebyshev equation, we have Hermit, we have Laguerre, we have Legendre, we have Lamé, we have Airy, we have Kummer. The list is not infinite, but very long, Gegenbauer, and so on. Many of them are related to each other. So uh, maybe I should have added here Bessel. I forgot Bessel. So <clears throat> they all have a, a, a proper name because they are related to orthogonal polynomials, and orthogonal polynomials carry these names. So I'm not giving you all the equations, but maybe the simple ones. So the area equation, why? This is maybe the, <laughs> the most amazing one among these classical equations. This one <laughs> looks really easy, no? but it's tricky. We have two solutions at zero. So maybe I make it here. So y1 of x, now I have to write a little bit, k equals zero to infinity. You take the quotient 2 times 3, I hope you can read, times 5 times 6, up to 3k minus 1 times 3k, and then the variable to the power 3k. So you have, there is always a one factor missing here. And the second one is symmetric to it, y2 of x. Again, k equals 0 to infinity, 1 over, and now you start with 3, 4, 6, 7. You go up to 3k, 3k plus 1, and get again x to the 3k. So you see, there is a lot to explore. Huh? Why such a simple equation has so complicated solutions? Do I have another one which is nice? Yeah, Hermit is, is not very complicated either. It is y double prime minus 2xy prime. Many of them are kind of equivalent to each other. So <clears throat> they carry a proper name. Here you get as solutions Hermit polynomials. Fine, I think I could give more equations, but that's enough for today. So this was, of course, kind of a, not brainstorming, but a, an overview of equations, phenomena, things which can happen. And next week, same time, same station, and I will send you an announcement of the contents, we will so what I plan to do is to be at the beginning quite systematic to give you first the characterization of regular singularities as Fuchs proposed. And then we will, at least for the regular singularities, we will construct all solutions in a very systematic way. Okay? 
This is already uh, a program which will probably cover the whole month of October. We don't have so many, so at least two sessions. And then we pass on to uh, some of the phenomena which uh, appear here. Of course, you are also invited to, to propose topics you would like to be covered. I won't be able to cover whatever you want because I'm not the specialist. There are people who know much better. But if we achieve a kind of roundup picture of what is happening, and if you see that fascinating things are happening, I will also be happy. So send me your comments. Thank you for listening. And hopefully see you next week. Bye-bye and have a wonderful evening. And those in the US, a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Harry. Bye. Bye.